God, you're wonderful, God. You're an awesome God, Lord. Your presence is truly in this place this morning. From the first worship song up until now, God, we, we felt you and we knew that you were here. So we thank you for that. So God, as we open the scripture, God, to talk about the death on the cross, we recognize what you did and we don't take that lightly, God. So I am praying that as we stand to speak and we stand to share your word this morning, God, that our people would listen carefully and intently to the finished work and the importance and the significance of your death on that cross. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing, for how you're moving, and for you being God in our midst, Lord. So we worship you, and we give you praise, God. Open our hearts to hear. Speak through me to your people, God, so we can be the recipients and the receivers of your word. So we love you, we worship you, and we adore you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. And amen. Come on, for those in the sanctuary, let's just put our hands together wherever you find yourself. Yeah, we serve an awesome God. Amen. Come on, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Like we said, next week we're going to be um, opening up for service. So mark your calendar. Make sure you connect with us uh, to receive and hear what God is doing. Boy, I tell you what, it's been a year, right? Almost a, a year of the body coming together. And you really miss those times. You miss the move of God. You miss the presence of God. It's one thing to be preaching from something else, someplace else. It's another thing to be in the presence of, of God in this sanctuary. So the presence of God truly was here uh, this morning and is here. So we thank God for that. So grab your Bibles. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go uh, into the fourth part of this series. We started off the series by painting a picture uh, so far of the, the issue and the invitation has been to meet me on the, cr the cross. The first meeting is this Friday night. You don't want to miss that. We are going to be social distance. We are going to take all the COVID precautionary measures. We are going to be doing all of that. So you're invited to come um, and be a part of what God is doing. And then Sunday morning, we're going to do the same thing, our formal reopening as we celebrate our little people, our little kids have an exciting, uh, we're going to be profiling them on the front end. So I'm excited about that uh, to make sure you're part of what God is doing. So allow God to move and have his way. So we saw the need for the cross week one. That the cross come up came about because of sin, um, how sin entered the world. We saw the journey to the cross, how it was scripture prophes prophesied in Genesis 3.16, uh, 3.15, I'm sorry, that, that um, the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent, but all he will do was bruise his heel. We saw that in how Christ chose Abraham and the lineage of Abraham to send um, this promised Messiah into the earth realm. And then last week, the Christ of the cross, we saw how the promised Messiah was none other than God himself coming in the form of flesh to die for you and to die for myself on the cross. Um, this morning, we're going to look at the death of the cross. And I want you to hear this. I just want to talk to you this morning about the significance of the death because as I've been preparing and as I've spent some time this week in the presence of the Lord, this, this word, it was really Really a freeing word to me and, and, and just reminding me of who God is and what God has done. And I'm trusting that wherever you find yourself this morning as well, that the word would end up being freeing to you. Um, so we want to allow God to just move and have his way. Let me, there's six things I want to share with you and six sounds like a lot, but I'm going to move fairly quickly and I'm going to invite you to go back and relive uh, this sermon on the RCF network, the YouTube channel or Facebook, just relive it um, throughout the entirety of this week, I really feel that the word is going to be a blessing to you. Let me begin by reading this statement, and I'm going to share the six things that I want to talk about, the significance of the death of the cross. The first, I want you to hear this, this big idea, and it's, it's a summation of what the message is going to be this morning. Um, Jesus' death by crucifixion was a divinely ordained historical event by which he lovingly accomplished atonement. He purchased Christians' freedoms from sins, bondage, and then he won their justification before the Father. And then more importantly, 
He triumphs over Satan's tyranny. I'm going to read it again because you're going to hear that in its various form in the sermon this morning. Jesus' death by crucifixion was, divinely, was a divinely ordained historical event by which he lovingly accomplished atonement. He purchased Christians' freedom from sin's bondage. He won their justification before the Father. And then he triumphed over Satan's tyranny. That's the hallelujah right there. So we'll spend some time fleshing out those six things as we talk about about them this morning. But if you have your notepad in front of you, I want to share six, six things with you as it relates to the importance and the significance of the death and what Christ did on that cross. The first thing I want you to hear me say this morning, and I trust that our tech team can track with me as you put this on the screen. Number one is that this, Christ's death on the cross, it paid the price for the sins of the world. That's number one. That's a hallelujah, guys. That Christ's death on the cross, it paid the price for the sins of the world. Now, if you have your Bible, jump over to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. I want to talk through that and explain what I mean by that because there's some key words that we must lock into and we must understand so we can get a good feel of the finished work of Christ and what Christ did on the cross that will be so beneficial to you and so beneficial to me, right? Here is what Hebrews 9 and 22, just one verse of Scripture, here is what it reads, right? Here's what it says. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. I'm going to say it again. Indeed, under the law, this is one of the scriptures I want you all to track with me. Um, almost everything is purified with blood. And listen to what it says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Some of your translation may say, there is no remission of sin. So hear me, point number one, right? Christ's death on the cross, it paid the price for the sins of the world. Now, there's two words you've got to hear me mention theologically as we talk about the importance of the death on the cross. And I want you to hear this term, substitutionary atonement, okay? Um, substitutionary atonement. So here's what that first word, substitution, means. That when Jesus went to this cross, and, and I'm almost tempted to preach from right there because you've got to get this. When Jesus went to that cross, he should not have been on that cross. Let me start there. Why are you saying he should not have been on the cross, preacher? Let me get ahead of myself. Because Jesus did no wrong, right? He was the perfect sacrifice. He who knew no sin, the scripture says, became sin for me. I am the sinner, Go ahead and say amen, because I'm saying I am, but I know you are too, <laughs> right? We are the sinners, okay? So here's the point. We should have been the one that was laid on this cross with nails in our feet and nails in our arms. We were the ones that failed God. We were the ones that blew it. We were the ones that sinned. And if you understand the Old Testament concept of, of atonement for sin, I'm going to hit that word in a little while. Here's what it looked like in the Old Testament when a person sinned. We've been talking about this throughout the entirety of the series. An animal was the substitute. And I'm going to hit that in a little while. But now, here's what we're seeing. Because I sin and because you sin, Here's what John 3, 16 said, and we saw this last week. God um, loved the world that he gave his only son. That, and, and why did he give his son to go on that cross and to die? I love this in my place. Okay? Now, if that is not love, I don't know what is. Okay? That God loves me, that God loves you, that God loves us so much. Okay? And I'm going to try to say as theological as I can. He incarnated himself in the form of flesh, and he said to me, when, when I'm the one that should be going to jail, when I'm the one that should be going to hell, when you are the one that should be going to jail, and you're the one that should be going to hell, here's what he does. He comes, and he puts his arms around you, and he pushes us aside, and he said, no, Save them, kill me. My goodness, come on, y'all. He took the hit for me. He took the hit 
for you. And, and let me help you with this. When, when I got a revelation of that, I relived my life in my head. And as I relived my life, I realized, man, I've done some crazy stuff. I've done some stupid stuff. I've done some dirty stuff. I've done some stuff that doesn't deserve love. Why would God want to take the hit from me? Maybe you've been holy your whole life. And, and, and don't fool yourself because you haven't been, all right? <laughs> maybe you haven't messed up, and maybe we fool ourselves into thinking that we all that, but we are the ones that deserve to be here. And number one, what we're saying is that Christ took the place, and here's what he did. He went on the cross, and here's my second word. He atoned for our sin, or he paid the price for our sin. So here's what that means. I don't have to suffer the consequences. In other words... I don't have to go to hell because of what he did. Oh, come on, y'all. I don't have to go to hell because of what he did. He paid the price for my sins. Come on, point to yourself and say, self, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but his blood has washed it white as snow. White as snow. He died in my place. Number one, he paid the price for my sin. That's the first thing. I'm going to move quick. Here's the second thing that he did, right? His death on the cross caused me to regain favor with God. Oh, yeah. I like this one, okay? His death on that cross, it caused me, secondly, to regain favor with God, right? So here, here's the theological term, right? Is the word propitiation or the, the, the other word that's called expiation, right? Here's how John chapter 2, look at this next scripture in 1 John chapter 2 and 2, right? Here's what this scripture says, right? It says, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's important. That's important, right? So he died for my sin. He died for your sins. He died for the sins for the entire world. And here's why he did it. Not only to forgive our sins, not only to put us in right standing, but listen, so we can be positioned to regain favor with God. This is very, very important. Let me help you understand what this means. It means that Jesus' death on the cross for the sins of the world, or for mankind, it put away God's wrath against people for all times. Let me explain this. I want to be very careful, and I want you to get to understand what I'm saying. Here's what this looked like in pagan religion back in, in ancient Israel lifetime. The, the, the pagans had this belief that when they saw something catastrophic happening in the world, somebody messed up, somebody blew it, somebody did something wrong, and so the gods, small g, was angry with them, and what it would require some sort of an excellent sacrifice Sacrifice. This is why you would notice in the pagan world they had child sacrifice. They would sacrifice their firstborn. They would sacrifice all these things because here's what they were trying to do. They were trying to win favor with the gods again, or here's a theolo theological term. They were trying to appease the god. So when they did something wrong, here's what they would do. They would bring their best and they would offer it to the gods hoping that they can regain favor with God. Now, that's, that, that's an important concept because the same thing transfers over theologically into Christendom, right? When we sin, when we blow it, we are inviting the wrath of God to come against us. You don't believe me? Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. You remember the flood. The whole premise of the flood in the days of Noah was that the world had become so sinful that God literally became angry. And here's what he did. I'm going to wipe mankind from the face of the earth. That's what he said. But the death of Christ on the cross, it causes us to regain favor. Let me help you understand this with an illustration. I've got four grandkids. I've got four lovely, and I, I, I thank God for the parents of those grandkids because they're doing a great job raising those kids. Those are some lovely kids. They're well-behaved. They conduct themselves well. They're, they're mannerly. I, I just love my grandchildren. And, and, and sometimes to the point of a fault where 
I love them. I, I, I'll do anything I can, give my life, give everything I can for those kids. But now being human and them being children, sometimes they get on my reserve nerve. All right, now let's be honest about that. Sometimes they get on my reserve nerve. They'll do something. You know, everybody has this in their house. Don't touch that. Don't go there. Don't do that. And sometimes they think my love for them gives them freedom to go there, to touch that, and to do that. Right? Uh, come on, y'all. We do the same thing with God sometimes. Come on. We, we think because he loves us so much, it's a license for us to go there and do that and touch that. But he, he himself has rules. Don't go there. Don't touch that. Don't do that. And here's what happened. When my kids get on my reserve nerve and my grandkids, and they know they've done something wrong, they can feel the air of my wrath. All I got to do is look. Come on, y'all. And when I put my look on, here's what, oh, boy, we in trouble with Grandpa. And inevitably, I've got three boys and one girl. That little girl is almost as if she'll say to her brothers, don't worry, I got this. And she'll step up in front and put that girly little eye on, Grandpa, you know I love you. And when she does that, it doesn't matter how mad I am. <laughs> It just melts your heart. Come on, y'all. And, and what she does, she sacrifices herself to win the favor, put me back in favor, and to put her brothers back into right favor with me. Okay? The reason I'm bringing that up to you is because when we sin, we were inviting the wrath of God upon us. We were inviting the wrath of God where we're saying, God, you know, I deserve to go to hell. God, punish me. God, do this. But here's what Jesus did. He comes down on the cross. Don't worry, I got this. And he goes to God. And he says, put me on the cross. Are oh, y'all not hearing me? Put me on the cross. And his death on the cross causes God to smile again. And here's what it does, number two. It puts me back in the right favor with God. I'm hoping you're getting this. I'm hoping you're getting this, right? Here's what the scripture says in John. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. That's good news. Had Christ not died on the cross, the word favor would mean nothing in my relationship with God. He paid the price. Does this make sense? Come on, say amen. He puts favor. Here, here's number three. Here's number three. Here's number three. And, and, and we all get this one. His death on the cross, Christ's death on the cross, here's what it did. It fulfilled the requirements of the law, right? Two scriptures. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 4. Let me read Romans 10 and 4. And then I want to look at uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2, 14. Write those scriptures down. And track with me. It fulfilled the requirements of the law. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the end of the law, right? He is the end of the law. Now, notice how he did this. Go look at Colossians. Let me show you how Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Look at Colossians. And look with me at Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 14. Let me... Um, uh, 2.14, it says he does this by what? By canceling the debt that stood against us for, with his legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And verse 15 says, he disarmed the rulers. You guys see that? Disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to open shame by triumphing them over the cross. Here's the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was a, a bunch of do's and don't, do's and don't, do's and don't, and do's and don't. And if you've been in Sunday school or you grew up in church in any length of time, here's what we learned in Sunday school. Nothing we do could fulfill the requirements of the law. We would always fall short of trying to fulfill the requirements of the law. There is nothing that we could do to fulfill the requirements of the law. Here's what Christ did, right? He, does, he, he comes and he dies in our place, meaning that I don't have to go through all the jot and tittle of the law anymore. I, I don't have to, to try to, to work my way to get into heaven. I don't try to have to, to be this goody two-shoe to try to make it into heaven. I don't have to bring sacrifices. I don't have to do all this stuff right because of what he did on that cross. He paid the price and he fulfilled the requirements of the, the law. Two words, two theological words is associated with that. He justified me. Right? 
That's the forensic term. It's the judicial term. He justified me, meaning what? That, that when God now looks at me, he sees me as just as if I had never sinned. Y'all got to get that. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it. Here's me humanistically. You do me wrong. I might forgive you or I'll do the Christian thing. I'll say I forgive you, but just let me see you. And the moment I see you, guess what? I remember what you did. Can we be honest this morning? And then you might not know it, but I'm living your faults all over again every single time I see you. And the sad, sad commentary is that could potentially be with me the entirety of my life. Here's justification, right? This is the fulfillment of the law. God forgives me, and when he sees me, he doesn't even know what I did in my past. Oh, my gosh, y'all didn't get that. Oh, I'm going to walk around for a little while. <sighs> Come on, y'all, that's good news. That's good news. That's why he can love me, and that's why he can give me a second chance and a third chance. That's why he says, when Peter asked him how many times should I forgive my brother, he said, do it as much as you need to do it, such that when you see him, you will act like he never did anything. You won't even remember. I wish I had somebody in here. You won't remember what he did. That's what he did for us on that cross when he sees me. He blots away my sin as far as from the east as from the yes. Hey, God, you know that old Felix? I don't, who are you talking about? That's the kind of God we serve. That's justification. Here's sanctification. He justifies me, and then he puts me on a path to grow me up day by day. So every day I'm alike, I become more like him. And the path is to continually growing me and growing me and growing me and growing me till I achieve perfection in my death and I end up being in this presence. You've got to get this. This is, I'm talking about what happened at the death of his cross. When he died, this is what happened. He justified me. And, and the Felix you see today is not going to be the Felix you see tomorrow. And it's not going to be the Felix that you see the day after. Come on, y'all. And it's not going to be the Felix that you see the next day. If you see a person that's the same yesterday and they still the same tomorrow and they still the same the day after, pick them up and drop them off at the cross and let Jesus do his work. In their life. Come on, is this making sense? He, he did away with the law, right? And then here's number four. I got two more. I'm almost there. Here's number four. His death on the cross, here's what it does. It cleanses. It cleanses me from sin. It cleanses. Now, come on, y'all say cleanses. Say it again. Say cleanses. The problem with the usage of that word is the English doesn't do justice to what's being nuanced in the original language, right? We hear cleanses, and here's what we do. We see something that we just washed, and we put it up here knowing that it can get dirty again. And then here's what we got to do. We got to wash it again and hang it back up to know it's going to get dirty again. And then we got to take it down, and we got to wash it again and hang it back up so it doesn't get dirty again. And we got to take it down and wash it again. And we spend the entirety of our life washing and hanging up and washing and hanging up and washing and hanging up and washing and hanging up. That was the Old Testament theology. When I sin, I got a cow or I got a sheep or I got a lamb or I got a goat or I got a, a bird, depending on my financial situation. And I would take it into the altar over and over again. And then I'd go back and I'd see this situation. Then I'd mess up. I had to go get another cow. I'd kill it. I had to get another goat. And I had to take it back over again. So the entirety of my life in the Old Testament was I got to wash it and I got to hang it up. And I got to wash it and I got to hang it up. And I got to wash it and I got to hang it up. And I got to wash it and I got to hang it up. Then Jesus come on the scene. He says, save your washing powder. <laughs> He goes on the cross, and he dies. And here's, here's the theology. Once for all, once for all, the death he died. He died once 
for all. This is Hebrews 6. It's impossible to put Christ on the cross and put him to open shame and kill him again. When he died, he did an eternal washing and hanging up. So when I sin, I don't have to say, wash and hang up. All I got to say, I messed up. And he said, paid for. <laughs> then I messed up again. He said, Lord, I'll blow it again. And he says, paid for. Come on, y'all, that's good news. Come on, y'all, that's good news. And then I blow it, and he says, paid for. I wish I had somebody in here. You get it? Once for all. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. I don't even realize this. I'm living life, and there is an eternal washing that's been going on the whole time because he already cleansed me. He already forgave me. He already made me whole. I have just, I need to get to the point where I come into the realization of what Christ already did and stop messing up so much. The works that on him... It's on my, here's the word I just used, sanctification to become what? Like him. I'm hoping this is making sense, y'all. So, so, so he washed me, right? He washed me. (laughs) Let me listen to Hebrews 12. Here's what it says. He entered once for all into the Holy of Holies by means of his blood, not the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he secured my eternal redemption. His own blood, his own blood. He returned, he secured my eternal redemption. This is sweet because it's going to go into the second one and it's going to go into the last one real quick. So I don't have to, he doesn't have to die every time I sin. He doesn't have to die again every time you sin. He already died. And his, die, his dying was for today's sin, tomorrow's sin, tomorrow, tomorrow's sins, next month's sin, next year's sin. When I'm 99, Lord, Grace me to live that long, that sin. You kind of get it? It's an eternal thing. Come on, is this making sense, right? He paid the price, right? So here's number five. Number five is, is very, very important. Number five means this. The death of the cross, here's what it does. It gives me now power over sin. Let me slow down because I want to read this. Why are you saying that his death gave me power over sin Because I've already been forgiven for the sin, and in order for him to forgive me for the thing, even though I've not yet committed it, it means that if I give it, I do the sin, it's not because I had to, it's because I wanted to. I have power over it. Y'all, y'all, go to Romans. Romans chapter 6. Let me read this. I'm going to let this speak for itself. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. And then I'm going to give you the last one, then we'll end this. I'm home. Come on, is this helping you all? Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Let me just read. Here's what Romans 6 says. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no men, no means. How can we who died to sin, to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might do what? Walk in the newness of life. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united with him in his death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in his resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we all shall live with him. Verse 9, and we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. And look at this, sin no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died (laughs) to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So, people, we must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. Let me use this illustration. 
rumor had it that we're in the pandemic, that if you got corona, the coronavirus, and I'm saying rumor has it because it's not really a proven fact yet, that the virus enters your body and it builds up an immunity. And the likelihood of you getting corona a second time has been minimized, if not eliminated, because your body has become immune because you've got it once. And some people are using that to say, I don't need to get no injection because I had corona, or I don't need to wear a mask because I had corona. But the point of the illustration is this, is that you were infected, you can't get infected no more because your body survived the infection. Okay, now I said that to say this. Jesus went to the cross and he died. And then, here's the good news, he survived death. So his body developed an immunity to death. So death can come all at once. He walked crying, you can't kill me no more because you kill me once. My body is immune. You get it? So now he lives a free life, not being concerned with death, not having to die anymore because he is immune from death. My problem and your problem is this. You don't know that when Christ died on the cross, he also developed an immunity to sin. And when we accept Christ in our life as personal Lord and Savior, you kind of get this, right? We die with him symbolically. This is baptism. We are raised with him in baptism. And symbolically, you and I are immune to the slings of this world. Oh, you got to get this. But the problem is we don't know this. So the scripture says, shall we continue sinning that grace may abound? And here's what Paul says, no, you died to it. You have an immunity in your system. You don't have to give in to it no more. So you have power over sin. And here's what we do. We go around giving in to things we've already been immune from. I'm not saying we won't get tempted. You're going to get tempted. But tempted is not sin. It's giving in to the things that causes sin. So when I read Romans 6, if I died with Christ, and if I raised with Christ, there's really an immunity. So I have power over sin where I don't have to give in. You kind of get it? But being human, being human, and being human in the world is going to cause me to sin from time to time. This is why Jesus says, paid for. Does this make sense? Paid for. So listen, people, next time you're tempted, try this. I ain't got to do that. And walk away from it. And if you're able to walk away from it and not do it, what I just said to you is truth. You have an immunity in, in your system that you just got to learn how to use. I wish I had somebody in here. You get it? His death on the cross gave us power over the sin nature. Here's the last thing, and this is the shout. Christ's death on the cross, it brought judgment to Satan and his demons. This is what emphasizes more what I'm saying to you about the immunity to sin. Here, let me just tell you the scripture. Here's what the scripture says in Colossians 2.15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing them over the cross. Now, you'll remember this. In Genesis 3.15, when Adam and Eve sinned, here's what God said. The seed of the woman is going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. So, Calvary is all about the seed of the woman triumphing over the demonic realm. I wish I had time to go into this. But when Jesus died, I could imagine Satan and his demons having a party. We got him. We got him. We got him. He's in the grave. He's in our realm. He's in our domain. I can see them celebrating. I can see them having a great time. But then three days later, I can see them saying, what happened? And the scripture says he emerged with all power in his hand. 
You're coming. Listen to this. He took the sting out of death. We're going to talk about this next week. This is the importance of the empty cross. So here's the thing. If Jesus defeated the devil in his death, why in the world does the believer in Christ go around saying things like, the devil is on my back. The devil got me. The, no, 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 no. At the cross, he was already defeated. And if we know who we are, listen to this, greater is he that is in us than what? He that is in the world. So no demon in hell can do to you what we don't allow him to do. We have the victory because of the death of Christ on that cross. Oh my gosh, we've got to get this. So here's what I want you all to hear me say this morning, church. We can live a free life and I'm done. We can live a delivered life. We can live a sanctified life. We can live a holy life. We can live a life in this world where we can be in it, but we don't have to be of the world. You have been set free. Whom the Son therefore has made free is free indeed. The death of Christ on the cross of Calvary has done some things to literally set us free. And we must understand that. When I say meet me at the cross, and let's understand the death of the cross, there are six things that Christ did. You got to hear this and we're going to pray. His death on the cross that paid the price for sin, number one. Number two, it caused us to regain favor with God, number two. Number three, it fulfilled the requirements of the law. You've got to hear this. Number four, it cleanses, continual cleansing from sin. Number five, it gives me power over sin. That's number five, okay? And then number six, it brings judgment on Satan and the demonic realm. I am hoping that this is a freeing word this morning and that it would encourage somebody next week we're going to celebrate the resurrection, the fact that the cross is empty. But I want you to hear me this morning. If you've been wrestling, maybe with depression, maybe oppression, maybe some sin, maybe something in your life, hear me this morning. Calvary is all about the freedom that God has in store for you. You've been set free. We don't have to give in. We don't have to do it again. We don't have to be that. We can be completely different. That's the God we serve. I want to pray with you this morning. And I want to say if, that's, if you're here and you have not yet given your life to Christ, here's an opportunity to do that. Here's an opportunity to say yes to God. Here's an opportunity to give yourself over to God, to allow God just to move and be God in your life. So wherever you find yourself, bow your heads with me this morning. Let's pray. Let's go and invite God to move and have his way. Father, we thank you for you. Thank you for the cross, God. It was the finished work on the cross that gave me freedom. It's the finished work on the cross, God, that has given me power to live. It's the finished work on the cross that's given me the ability to God to live a life that's pleasing to you. So God, if there's one that's saying, I want to give my life to God, I want to invite him into my life. Holy Spirit, the power of the cross, the power of your death on that cross, the blood, Hebrew 9 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sin. God, draw them into a relationship. Draw them into a relationship. So Holy Spirit, move and do what only you can do. We thank you for being God. 